Welcome back. As we have seen from our earlier lectures, a refrigeration system consists of several basic components such as compressors, condensers, evaporators, expansion devices. In addition to it, there will be several accessories such as uh, controls, safety devices, etc. The performance of any refrigeration system depends uh, upon the individual performance of these components uh, and how well they are ba balanced when assembled. Okay, so, before we study the performance of a complete system, let us look at the performance aspects of these individual components. So, let us begin this discussion with a compressor which is called as the heart of any vapor compression refrigeration system. So, the specific objectives of this particular lecture are to classify refrigerant compressors, introduce open hermetic and semi hermetic compressors, discuss important performance parameters, discuss performance of an ideal compressor without clearance and finally, discuss performance of an ideal compressor with clearance. So, at the end of this lecture, you should be able to list different types of refrigerant compressors, explain open hermetic and semi hermetic compressors and their char characteristics, list important performance parameters, evaluate the performance of an ideal compressor without clearance and finally, evaluate the performance of an ideal compressor with clearance. Let me give a brief introduction to compressors. A compressor is the most important and often the costliest component of any vapor compression refrigeration system. Typically, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the total plant cost is because of the compressor. So, it is a very important component. The compressor, what is the function of the compressor? The compressor as you know has to draw the refrigerant vapor from the evaporator so that a low pressure and temperature can be maintained at which the refrigerant can boil extracting heat from the refrigerated space. So, this is the first uh, objective. Not only that, uh, it also has to raise the pressure of refrigerant to a level at which it can condense by rejecting heat to the cooling medium in the condenser. That means, typically a compressor will have a suction side and a uh, discharge side. On the suction side, uh, refrigerant vapor from the evaporator enters into the compressor this uh, refrigerant vapor gets compressed in the compressor and is discharged to the condenser where it can condense. So, this is the primary objective of any compressor. Compressors can be classified uh, based on the working principle for example, as uh, positive displacement type of compressors, rotodynamic type of compressors. We can also classify them based on the arrangement of compressor motor or external drive and based on this particular uh, type, we can have open type compressors we can have hermetic or seal type compressors or semi hermetic or semi seal type compressors. Now, let us look at uh, positive displacement type of compressors. In these compressors, compression is achieved by trapping a refrigerant vapor into an enclosed space and then reducing its volume. Since a fixed amount of refrigerant is trapped each time, its pressure rises as its volume is reduced. When the refrigerant pressure inside the compressor rises to the level of condensing pressure, then the refrigerant is expelled from the enclosed space and a fresh charge of refrigerant is drawn in and the cycle continues. That means, initially we have to uh, take in certain amount of uh, refrigerant vapor in an enclosed space using piston, cylinder, valves, etcetera and then reduce the volume of this refrigerant so that its pressure can rise and when this pressure uh, rises to the level of condenser uh, pressure, then the refrigerant is expelled from the compressor and a fresh charge is taken in. So, this is the working principle of a positive displacement type of compressor. Since the flow of refrigerant to the compressor is not steady, the positive displacement type compressor is a pulsating flow device. So, you can see that you, during one stroke you have suction and during one stroke you have compression and during the other another stroke you have discharge. So, the flow rate of refrigerant is not steady. So, it is basically a pulsating uh, flow uh, device. So, however, since the operating speeds are normally very high, that means the rotational speeds of the compressors are so high that the flow appears to be almost steady on macroscopic time scale. However, since the flow is pulsating on a microscopic time scale, positive displacement type compressors are prone to high wear, vibration and noise level. So, this is one uh, problem of with the positive displacement type of compressors. The positive displacement type compressors can be classified into reciprocating type, rotary type with sliding vanes. Again, rotary type can be either rolling uh, piston type or multiple vane type. We can also have rotary screw type, either single screw or twin screw type, orbital compressors and finally, acoustic compressors. 
Now let us look at rotodynamic compressors. In these compressors, the pressure rise is achieved by imparting kinetic energy or angular momentum to a steadily flowing stream of refrigerant by a rotating mechanical element and then converting the kinetic energy into pressure as the refrigerant flows through a diverging passage. That means what is done is a uh, charge of refrigerant is taken into the compressor steadily and angular momentum is imparted to this uh, refrigerant by a high speed rotating mechanical element such as a blade of the compressor. As a result, the kinetic energy of the refrigerant increases, then this kinetic energy is converted into pressure uh, by forcing the refrigerant to flow through a diverging passage. So, this is the working principle of rotodynamic compressors. Unlike uh, positive displacement type compressors, rotodynamic type compressors are steady flow devices. Hence, they are subjected to less wear and vibration. So, this is an advantage of rotodynamic compressors. Rotodynamic type compressors can be classified into radial flow type or axial flow type. Centrifugal compressors or turbo compressors or radial flow type compressors and these are widely used in large capacity refrigeration and air conditioning systems. Axial flow type compressors are not normally used in air conditioning, but they are used in certain special applications such as gas liquefaction. Now, let us look at open type uh, compressors. What do we mean by open type compressor? In open type compressors, the rotating shaft of the compressor extends through a seal in the crankcase for an external drive. The compressor may be belt driven which is more common or gear driven. It is rarely gear driven, but in principle you can have gear drive. The external drive may be an electric motor or an external engine. For example, one can use a st uh, steam engine or a diesel engine for running the compressor. Open type compressors are normally used in medium to large capacity refrigeration systems for all refrigerants and also for ammonia for all capacities. So, let me explain uh, an open type compressor. So, you can see that uh, the, this figure here shows the open type compressor. This is the uh, this is the cylinder and you have the piston here, this is the piston and you have the inlet uh, uh, section here and then outlet. Okay. And you can see that you also have a connecting rod which connects the piston with the crankshaft here. So, this is the crankshaft. Okay. So, the connecting rod connects the piston and the crankshaft and this in turn comes out of the body of the cylinder through a gas seal here and is connected to an external drive. So, here it is connected to an external drive. So, you can use either belt drive or a gear drive and you can connect it this drive to uh, this uh, it can be coupled to a electric motor or a, an engine. Okay. So, one of the problems uh, with this type of compressors as you can see is this uh, shaft has to rotate. So, certain clearance must be provided at the seal so that it can rotate without too much of friction. So, when you are providing certain uh, uh, amount of gap here there is a possibility of refrigerant leakage. Okay. So, this is one typical problem with the uh, open type of compressors. However, uh, as we shall see later, these compressors have uh, higher efficiency and uh, the heat of compression uh, can be rejected directly to external air. Okay. So, heat rejection can take place externally. Normally, these uh, compressors are connected to service valves at the inlet side and the outlet side. And uh, at the bottom of the cylinder, you have a so oil sump where lubricating oil is stored. This in fact shows the sectional view of a an industrial uh, two cylinder open type compressor is a vertical arrangement. So, you can see the fins here for uh, okay, so let me go back. You can see the fins here for uh, heat rejection and uh, you can see several components. This, since this is an actual co compressor, there are many other components and basically you can see the discharge valve. Uh, uh, there are two compressors here. So, you have the uh, manifolds for discharge and suction lines here and uh, you have the flywheel which is connected to a bell drive or a gear drive uh, um, and this is a connecting rod and the crankshaft etcetera.
So, uh, what are the characteristics of open type compressors? Open type compressors are characterized by uh, high efficiency, flexibility, better compressor cooling and serviceability. Uh, why do we get high efficiency? We get high efficiency because both the compressor and, and the motor normally reject heat to the surrounding air. As a result, the heat rejection from the compressor and motor do not become a part of the refrigeration load, hence you get higher efficiency. Um, and uh, these uh, systems are flexible because you can vary the speed of the compressors, uh, because if you have a bell drive, you can vary the speed and if you have a gate drive also you can vary the speed, so they offer flexibility. Another advantage of these compressors is if you are using a bell drive, there is no possibility of motor getting overloaded, because if the compressor is overloaded then the belt starts slipping, okay. so this is another advantage of open type compressors. Normally open type compressors are used in large systems because they are serviceable, okay. they are not used in throw type, uh, so you can service them you can replace the valves, you can replace the gaskets, etc. Okay. So, that is the reason why they find applications in large systems. However, they have one problem as I have already explained, uh, the rotating shaft has to pass through uh, a seal, so there is a continuous refrigerant leakage through the seal. Of course, the leakage can be minimized by designing the seal properly, but it cannot be eliminated completely. So, you have a continuous refrigerant leakage from the system. So, to take care of these uh, refrigerant leakage, you have to have a refrigerant reservoir inside the system, which will take care of the refrigerant leakage to some extent. However, after certain time, you have to charge the system with refrigerant, okay. that is the reason they require a periodic servicing. Uh, since the uh, periodic servicing uh, is uh, possible in large systems where uh, people are available for to do the servicing, they are normally used in large uh, capacity systems. In addition, as I have already told you, since they offer higher efficiency and higher efficiency is very important in uh, large capacity systems, uh, in all large capacity systems, the open type compressors are uh, used. Okay. So, as I have already explained, uh, the uh, these refer system, these compressors require a refrigerant reservoir and regular maintenance. Now let us look at hermetic compressors. These are also known as seal type of compressors. In these compressors, the motor and compressor are enclosed in the same housing. So this prevents refrigerant leakage. The housing has welded connections for refrigerant inlet and outlet and for power input socket. As a result of this, there is virtually no possibility of refrigerant leakage from the compressor. So, the hermetic compressors have been developed to take care of the problems posed by open type of compressors, typically uh, refrigerant leakage which calls for periodic maintenance. Periodic maintenance as I have already told you is possible in large systems where service personnel are available, but uh, you cannot have peer regular maintenance in for example, say domestic refrigerators or room air conditioners. So, as a result of which people have developed the hermetic compressors which are leak proof. Okay. So, how do we get uh, a leak proof arrangement? Let, let me show the figure. Okay. So, here uh, this shows a schematic of uh, a hermetic compressor. You have an outer casing, this is an outer uh, or outer shell. So, both the motor and the compressor are housed in the same. Uh, housing. Okay. Uh, so, there is no possibility of refrigerant leakage for example, uh, from this point. If there is any refrigerant leakage from the compressor, uh, the refrigerant stays inside the outer shell. Okay. So, you have the refrigerant contained within the shell okay. and the connections are typically welded or braced. So, you have permanent connection at the inlet and outlet. So, there is no possibility of refrigerant leakage. So, in this particular arrangement, the refrigerant uh, enters uh, like this and uh, it cools the motor and it also cools the compressor and then it enters through this uh, suction valve, you have the suction valve here okay. into the compressor, this is the piston of the compressor and it gets compressed and when the pressure rises uh, above the condensing pressure, this discharge valve, this is the discharge valve, discharge valve opens and refrigerant goes out of the um, outlet to the condenser. So, the and again you have a lubricating oil, oil sump uh, here. Okay. Uh, so, as you can see that uh, the advantage of this compressor are virtually there is no refrigerant leakage and since both motor and compressor are kept in the same housing, the noise levels are also typically lower in this case compared to an open type of compressor. So, you can see that the compressor is directly mounted on the motor shaft. So, uh, the, this poses a problem uh, for example, when the compressor is uh, overloaded, motor also gets overloaded. 
okay and since refrigerant comes in contact with the motor winding there must be compatibility with them between the uh, insulation on the mo motor winding and the refrigerant so that is very important here so this shows the uh, cut view of an industrial uh, refri uh, refrigerant compressor of hermetic type so you can see the the copper uh, winding here Okay, and this is outer shell and these are the connections for inlet and outlet and this is for the electrical connections. So from the outside you really do not see anything you just see a shell and uh, two, two connections one for the suction line and the other for the discharge line and the electrical connections. Okay, so this is a typical uh, hermetic uh, compressor used in small capacity systems. So in hermetic compressors as we have seen heat cannot be rejected completely to the surrounding air since both motor and compressor are enclosed in a shell as explained. Hence the cold suction gas is more made to flow over the motor and the compressor before entering into the compressor that means the suction gas itself is used to keep the motor and compressor cool. As a result of which the motor remains cool. However, this reduces the efficiency of the refrigerant system. How does it reduce efficiency? Because the heat uh, rejected by the motor and compressor are picked by the refrigerant itself. So finally, it has to be reject, it has to be uh, taken out at the evaporator. That means the inefficiencies of the motor and compressor uh, become a part of the refrigerant load, uh, which uh, consumes higher power. Okay, because you have to uh, provide extra refrigeration effect to take care of these heat rejections as a result all uh, the hermetic type of compressors ha offer typically lower efficiencies compared to open type of compressors okay and another problem is if the refrigerant flow rate is not sufficient and or if the temperature is not low enough the insulation and the winding of the motor can burn out due to overheating and this may result in short circuiting this is actually a serious problem for example you have designed the motor and compressor for certain operating condition and the operating conditions change as a result the refrigerant flow rate reduces and also its temperature increases so when its flow rate reduces and its temperature increases the capacity of the refrigerant to take out the heat from the motor and compressor reduces as a result the motor temperature increases the winding temperature increases when the winding temperature increases beyond a certain uh, point the insulation on the winding may burn out okay so once it burns out uh, short circuiting of the winding takes place and the motor uh, gets damaged okay so this is a major problem in uh, hermetic uh, compressors so normally hermetic compressors are not used over a wide range of operating conditions they are, they are, uh, work satisfactorily over a very na narrow range of operating conditions okay so as i said that they are perform only over a no narrow range of operating conditions and as i have already explained the motor winding is in direct contact with the refrigerant and hence only those refrigerants which have di high dielectric di strength can be used in domestic refrigerants okay i mean in hermetic compressors you cannot use all kinds of uh, refrigerant you have to have good compatibility with between the winding and the refrigerant so hermetic compressors are widely used in applications where efficiency is not as important as customer convenience that means uh, in domestic refrigerators and room air conditioners. How does it ensure uh, customer convenience because uh, this is uh, free from uh, refrigerant leakage so the customer need not call the service personnel every day to charge the system. Okay, so once you charge the system with refrigerant it can run for years together without any servicing. This is what is required in small systems where regular maintenance is not possible. Okay, and this is the factor which uh, which has which is more important than efficiency in small systems because in small systems small increase in efficiency is not as important as the um, customer convenience. Okay, so this is the reason why we use uh, hermetic compressors in uh, small capacity systems such as uh, domestic refrigerators, small room air conditioners, water coolers, etc. Okay, and these systems we shall see later are also ideal in systems which use capillary tubes as expansion devices and as I have already told you hermetic compressors also offer low noise levels. Okay. But uh, one problem with these compressors are they are not very flexible because of the uh, limited operating range and you cannot also uh, vary the speed too much because once you vary the speed it may affect the compressor cooling. Okay. 
Now let us look at the third type of uh, compressor that is called a semi hermetic or semi field compressors. These are some uh, trade off between open type and hermetic type of compressors. Uh, in some larger capacity hermetic units the cylinder head is removable so that the valves and the piston can be serviced. That means basically a semi hermetic compressor is a hermetic compressor with a provision of limited servicing. Okay. Limited servicing means you can have access to the valves and you can have, have access to the piston. So, this type of unit is called the semi hermetic or semi sealed compressor. Uh, so, this compressor as I have already told you offers limited serviceability. Semi hermetic compressors are commonly used in factory assembled units such as packaged air conditioners. Now, let us look at uh, positive type displacement uh, compressors uh, that is uh, reciprocal. First, let us look at reciprocating compressor. As the name implies, the reciprocating motion of piston in the cylinder gives rise to suction and compression in a reciprocating compressor. Let me explain the working principle. So, you have as you can see that you have a cylinder here, suction valve, discharge valve, this is the piston and the piston is connected to the crankshaft by a connecting rod and the crankshaft is connected to the shaft and the balancing weight is provided for uh, the balancing of the system. And the connecting uh, rod and piston are uh, connected by a piston pin and the connecting rod and crankshaft are connected by a crank uh, pin and the connecting uh, uh, crankshaft will be basically rotating in this direction. So, the rotation of the crankshaft gives a uh, rectilinear motion of the uh, piston. So, as the piston moves uh, in this direction suction and compression takes place. For example, let us say that the piston is initially at this position okay, which you call it as inner dead center. Okay. So, and uh, from this point uh, as this moves in this direction the pressure inside the uh, cylinder falls. Once the pressure inside the cylinder falls the suction valve opens and refrigerant enters into the compressor. This process uh, takes place as long as this is moving towards the what is known as the outer dead center. And during the reverse stroke, the piston starts moving from the outer dead center to the inner dead center. So, pressure builds up inside the cylinder. As the pressure builds up, the suction valve closes. But since the pressure is lower than the discharge side pressure, discharge valve pressure also will remain closed. That means, during this process, during the compression process, both the suction valve as well as discharge valve remain closed and uh, the volume of the refrigerant trapped inside the cylinder is reduced because of the movement of the cylinder. As a result, the pressure rises and once the pressure rises to the level of the discharge pressure, the discharge valve opens and the refrigerant goes out of the discharge valve to the condenser due to the motion of the piston uh, in this direction. Okay, so, and uh, again that during the reverse stroke, this starts moving in the uh, opposite direction, again uh, next uh, cycle of uh, compression starts. Okay, so, this is a working principle of a reciprocating compressor. Reciprocating compressor is the most important type of compressor because it is a workhorse of refrigeration and air conditioning industry and these compressors are available in capacities ranging from a few watts to hundreds of kilowatts. And modern day reciprocating compressors are high speed that means uh, about 3000 to 3600 revolutions per minute. They are normally single acting and uh, they are either single or multi cylinder type. Multi cylinder means a single compressor can have as many as 16 cylinders. Now, let us look at performance of reciprocating compressors. For a given evaporating, uh, evaporator and condenser pressures, uh, important performance parameters of any refrigerant compressor are first one is the mass flow rate for a given compressor size or the volumetric capacity. That means, what is the refrigeration capacity per meter cube of the compressor size? This is the first important uh, performance parameter. Second important parameter is what is the power consumption? per unit refrigeration capacity expressed in kilowatt of uh, power consumption per kilowatt of refrigeration capacity. This is uh, the reverse of your uh, inverse of your COP. Then the third important parameter is what is the discharge temperature of the refrigerant at compressor exit. And fourth important performance parameter is how does the compressor perform under path load conditions. So, these are the four important uh, parameters of any refrigerant compressor. The mass flow rate uh, of uh, any compressor depends upon the size and speed of the compressor and also on the volumetric efficiency. So, what is volumetric efficiency? The volumetric efficiency is defined as the ratio of volumetric flow rate of refrigerant to the maximum possible volumetric flow rate. The maximum possible volumetric flow rate is also called as displacement rate of the compressor. That means, the volumetric flow efficiency is defined as 
as you can see from the equation volumetric flow rate divided by the compressor displacement. The volumetric flow rate in meter cube per second can be expressed as a product of mass flow rate of refrigerant in kg per second into the specific volume of the refrigerant at compressor inlet V e which is in kg per meter cube okay, divided by compressor displacement given by V dot S w. So, next important parameter as I uh, mentioned is the power consumption per unit refrigeration capacity. This depends upon the compressor efficiency eta c, efficiency of the mechanical drive eta mechanical and the motor efficiency eta motor. So, for a given uh, refrigerant compressor the power input uh, is given by uh, w c is equal to w ideal divided by uh, eta c into eta mechanical into eta motor. As I said eta c is the compression efficiency, eta mechanical is the mechanical efficiency and eta motor is the motor efficiency. And here W ideal is the power input to an ideal compressor. We will see what is an ideal compressor a little later. So, the third important parameter as I have already mentioned is the temperature at the exit of the compressor or the discharge temperature. The discharge temperature depends upon the type of refrigerant used and the type of compressor cooling for a given uh, evaporating and condenser pressures. Okay. Uh, what is the importance of this? Uh, this parameter has a bearing on the life of the compressor. So, this is very important practical parameter. And the fourth important performance parameter is the performance of the compressor under part load conditions. This depends on the type and design of the compressor. Now, let us look at an ideal uh, reciprocating compressor. So, how do you define an ideal reciprocating compressor? An ideal reciprocating compressor is one in which the clearance volume is 0. I will explain what is the clearance volume and there are no pressure drops during suction and compression and all the processes such as suction, compression and discharge are reversible and adiabatic. So, these are all these three criteria must be satisfied for a compressor to be called as an ideal, ideal compressor without clearance. So, this picture here shows the uh, an ideal uh, compressor without clearance on uh, PV diagram. Okay, you can see the volume is on x axis and pressure is on y axis. And it is also shown on uh, P theta diagram, theta is the crank angle, P is the pressure. Okay. And the compressor uh, schematic of the compressor is shown here. As I said, this is the cylinder and this is the piston and this is your connecting rod and this is the crankshaft. So, as the crankshaft rotates, you can see that the piston moves in this direction to and fro and uh, this causes the suction and uh, compression of the refrigerant gas. So, since this is a compressor without any clearance, uh, when the compressor starts moving in this direction that means from the inner dead center IDC, uh, there will not be any uh, uh, gas left in the compressor that means the uh, suction stroke starts right at this point okay? that means at point D. So, when the uh, suction stroke starts, the volume inside the cylinder is 0. That means, uh, this is what is known as a cylinder without any, a compressor without any clearance. Okay. Um, let me explain the processes uh, here. It consists of three processes. First process is process D 2 A. During this process, the piston moves from the inner dead center to the outer dead center. So, as the piston moves from the inner dead center to the outer dead center, initially there is no refrigerant gas inside the uh, cylinder. So, when once the piston starts moving, the pressure inside uh, falls below that of the suction uh, pressure. So, as a result, uh, uh, refrigerant vapor enters through the suction valve into the compressor. So, this process continues. Uh, as the piston continues to move from inner dead center to the outer dead center. That means, this process continues from D to A. Okay. So, this is what is shown on your uh, P theta diagram. Uh, typically, at this point you have an angle of 180 degrees. Okay. So, this is what is known as suction stroke. So, during this suction stroke, what is the piston uh, displacement? Piston displacement is nothing but this. Okay. That means, V A, the volume uh, V A. And what is the uh, volume of the gas that has entered? Volume of the gas that has entered is also equal to V A okay, because there is no uh, clearance here. So, now let us look at the second uh, process that is uh, compression process. Compression process is process A to B. So, during this process 
uh, the piston starts moving in the opposite direction that means from the outer dead center to the inner dead center as it starts moving in the outer de, uh, from outer dead center to inner dead center the volume of the refrigerant inside the cylinder starts uh, decreasing once it starts decreasing the pressure builds up here once the pressure builds up here the suction valve will be closed okay because uh, the pressure inside will be greater than the suction pressure so the suction valve is closed and the discharge valve also remains closed because here the uh, this pressure is lower than the condensing pressure as a result both the valves are closed so the volume gets reduced as the volume is reduced in this direction the pressure rises so this is the typical compression process and during this process the pressure rises from the evaporator pressure pe to the condenser pressure pc that means at point b okay so this is the suction uh, process and this uh, occupies certain uh, crank angle okay uh, from A to B. Now once the pressure uh, reaches that of the condenser pressure since this is an ideal compressor no pressure drop is required for uh, fluid flow. So as soon as the pressure reaches at this point further movement of the compressor from point B to C uh, results in uh, the opening of the discharge valve and flow of uh, refrigerant out of the discharge valve to the compressor that means there is a discharge of the refrigerant uh, from the compressor to the condenser okay that means process B to C is a discharge process. Okay. So during this process, uh, refrigerant at a constant pressure PC is expelled from the cylinder, and from here it goes to the condenser where it gets condensed. And this process ends as you can see at point C. And at point C, what is the volume of the refrigerant inside the uh, cylinder? It is zero. Okay, because there is no clearance. Right, so that is at this point. So during the reverse stroke, that means again uh, the piston is at IDC, and once it when it starts moving in the opposite direction, again the pressure starts falling. So the suction valve opens, refrigerant uh, fresh charge of refrigerant enters into the cylinder, okay, and the cycle continues. So this is the working principle of a compressor without a clearance. Since uh, you can see that the volumetric displacement. Uh, uh, rate of the compressor is equal to the volume of the gas taken in the volumetric efficient of the, of the ideal compressor without clearance is 100 percent okay. So the mass flow rate is given by m dot is equal to v dot sw where v dot sw is known as displacement rate divided by v e v is the uh, specific volume of the refrigerant at compressor inlet okay. So from this uh, expression you can see that for a given refrigeration capacity the required compressor size will be minimum for an ideal compressor without clearance because uh, here the mass flow rate pumped will be maximum for a given size. And uh, the displacement rate in meter cube per second of the compressor is given by V dot SW is equal to N small n into capital N into pi d square by 4 into L where small n is the number of cylinders you can have as many as 16 cylinders. <coughs> And, and uh, capital N is the rotational speed of compressor in revolutions per second and D is the di inner diameter of the cylinder or bore of the cylinder in meters and L is the stroke length in meters. So once you know the speed, number of compressor, number of cylinders, diameter and length you can find out what is the displacement rate using this expression. Now let us find out what is the work input of the ideal compressor because uh, as I said important parameters are the mass flow rate and work input. So work input to the ideal compressor without clearance uh, is given by WID and here WI capital W uh, subscript ID is the total work input of the compressor in one cycle and this is given by WDA plus WAB plus WBF. What are, what are these? Let me show on the cycle. So total uh, work input in one cycle WID is what is the work done during the process D to A plus what is the work input to the compressor during process A to B plus what is the work input to the compressor during process B to C okay because it consists of three processes. So the total work input is sum total of all these three processes. Now let us look at uh, these individual processes for example what is the work done during process D to A and who is doing work on what. During process D to A the refrigerant uh, does work on the piston okay and this process takes place at constant pressure. So the work uh, D to A is equal to integral PdV and if you are writing work output as negative uh, then it is minus integral PdV from 
initial prayer volume mod V D to final volume V A. Since initial volume is D, V D is 0. So, this simply becomes integral 0 to V A P into D V and P is constant at uh, P E. So, say, say this is simply equal to minus P E into V A. Okay. So, this is the work output actually because if you consider refrigerant as the system, uh, system is doing work on the uh, piston. Okay. So, you have the negative sign here. Now, what is the work input uh, to the system during the compression process that is during process A to B. During this process uh, again uh, the, uh, this is equal to integral uh, P D V because it is a closed system from V A to V B. Okay. And uh, this is the work input to the system because D V is uh, negative. So, system uh, 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 piston has to do work on the refrigerant. Okay. You cannot integrate this simply because you do you have to, to in order to perform this integration you have to know what is the relationship between P and V during this process. Okay. And finally, let us look at what is the work input uh, during process uh, B to C. This is an isobaric process. So, simply this is equal to integral uh, P D V from V B to V C. Okay. Uh, since this is a uh, work input if you are, you are using negative then this is simply equal to pressure is constant here this is equal to P C into V B because V C is equal to 0. Okay. So, that is how you can find out the work input during each process. So, that is what is shown here on P V diagram W D A is area under line D A. Okay. So, this is equal to minus P into V A and W A B. Uh, I am using the sign uh, convention here since I am calling this as work input uh, the uh, output becomes negative. Okay, So, that is the convention used here. So, W D A is the work output from the system. So, this becomes negative. Okay, So, minus P into V A. So, W A B is the area under curve A B which is equal to integral uh, P D V from V A to V B and W B C is area under line B C that is equal to P C into V B. Okay. So, the total uh, work input per cycle is given by some total of all these uh, work inputs that is minus P E into V A plus integral P D V from V A to V B plus P C into V B. So, this is nothing but area A B C D on P V diagram. Okay. So, thus the work input is equal to the area of the cycle on P V diagram which is uh, which can be shown to be equal to integral V D P from P E to P C. Okay. That means on the P V diagram uh, this is the to this hatched area. So, this is the total work input. Okay. So, this can be obtained by integrating uh, integral V D P. Okay. That means, you take a small uh, element at pressure P and uh, integrate it uh, from uh, uh, this uh, volume to this volume. Okay. That means, uh, this becomes integral V D P. This is D P. Okay. So, the specific now the specific work input, uh, specific work input is nothing but work input to the system per uh, kg of the refrigerant that means in kilo joule per kg. So, this is given by uh, work input per cycle divided by the mass of refrigerant compressed in cycle that is capital M subscript R. So, this is equal to W i d divided by capital M R which is equal to integral V d p where this uh, small v is the specific volume of the refrigerant and this integration has to be performed from P e to P c for the compression process. Now, the power input of the compressor is nothing but mass flow rate of the refrigerant m dot into W i d where W i d is the specific work input in kilo joule per kg. So, product of these two will give you the power input of the compressor. So, this is equal to this can be written mass flow rate is written in terms of the displacement rate uh, V dot S w and uh, specific volume okay, because m dot is equal to V dot S w divided by V e and W i d is integral. Uh, v d p where v is the specific volume. Okay. And we can also define a what is known as the mean effective pressure M E P and M E P is defined as the power input to the compressor divided by the uh, displacement rate. Okay. So, this should have been uh, this is uh, 
Wc this is the power input of the compressor divided by displacement rate V dot SW okay. So, from the above expression this is nothing but integral V dp divided by specific volume of the refrigerant uh, at the compressor inlet and the concept of mean effective pressure is quite useful for uh, real compressors because the power input of the compressor is the product of MEP and the displacement rate. That means if you know the mean effective pressure uh, for a real uh, compressor uh, then uh, if you want to know the power input of the compressor all that you have to do is you have to multiply the mean effective pressure with the compressor displacement rate. And uh, as you know the compressor displacement rate depends upon the number of cylinders uh, rotational speed of the compressor and the compressor dimensions which are typically known okay. So, you can easily calculate the power input of the compressor from the mean effective pressure all right. Now, the, you, uh, from the expression you can see that the power input and mean effective pressure can be obtained if the relationship between uh, specific volume and pressure during the compression process A, B are known. Okay. If the compression process is isentropic then uh, we know that uh, this process can be represented by the equation P V to the power of K is constant where K is isentropic index of compression. Okay. Uh, as you have seen WID that is the uh, specific work of compression is integral VDP. Okay. So, as I have already mentioned if you want to perform this integration you have to know what is the relationship between V and P during the compression process. Okay. So, the compression process can be anything it can be isothermal, it can be isentropic, it can be polytropic right and the relationship between uh, V and P varies depending upon the type of the process. If the for the ideal compressor we assume this process to be reversible adiabatic that means the process to be isentropic. If it is an isentropic process we know from our uh, basic thermodynamics that the process follows the um, equation P V to the power of K is constant where K is known as isentropic index of compression. Okay. So, once you know that uh, this relation you can easily perform the integration. Okay. So, that is what is done here. Uh, you, you substitute this expression P V to the power of K in the expression for uh, a specific work of compression. From this uh, you can show that the specific work of compression after integration is given by. So, here you are substitu substituting uh, this expression P V to the power of K is constant. So, if you are substituting you get this expression. Okay. So, as you know this uh, in this expression P is the suction pressure. V is the specific volume of the refrigerant at suction condition, K is the isentropic index of compression and P C is the condenser pressure. Okay. So, if you know these things you can find out the specific work of compression. This expression is valid for any reversible process. If, if the process is not isentropic, but some polytropic with an index of compression N all that you have to do is replace K by N. Okay. Uh, why do we say that this uh, expression is valid for reversible process? Because for a reversible process the process path is known that means you know the exact relationship between V and P during the process. Once you know the process path you can perform the integration that is why uh, this expression is valid for any reversible process. So, if the refrigerant behaves as an ideal gas we know that uh, index of compression is nothing but specific heat ratio gamma. Okay. But however, in general for uh, most of the refrigerants the value of K uh, vary, um, is different from uh, value of gamma and uh, this value uh, varies from point to point. And if this value is not known then an approximate value can be obtained from the values of pressure and specific volume at the suction and discharge states. That means, let us say we know the uh, suction pressure and suction specific volume and we also know the suction the discharge pressure and discharge specific volume and we know that the process follows the path P V to the power of K is constant. Uh, using this information we can find out the approximate value of K uh, which is equal to a uh, natural log of uh, P C divided by P E divided by natural log of V E divided by V C where P C and P E are condenser and evaporator pressures and V E and V C are uh, evaporator uh, specific volume at the inlet of the compressor and the specific volume at the outlet of the compressor. The specific work input can also be obtained from energy balance across the compressor. Okay. You, you can also perform energy balance and you can find out the specific work input. Uh, what do you mean by energy balance? That means, you can have uh, let us say that this is the compressor and uh, this is the inlet condition where ma m dot is the mass flow rate. Since this is a study we are assuming this to be a steady flow this thing. So, mass flow rate inlet mass flow rate is same as the outlet mass flow rate and these are the inlet condition inlet pressure P e, inlet temperature T e, inlet enthalpy H e and inlet entropy F e and outlet conditions pressure P c, uh, discharge temperature T d, discharge enthalpy H d and discharge entropy S t. 
okay and uh, you have a net amount of uh, work input wc supplied to the compressor and a net amount of heat transfer qc takes place from the compressor to the surroundings for uh, reversible adiabatic case this is equal to zero okay and if you assume that delta ke uh, and delta p that is uh, kinetic and potential energy changes across the control volume are negligible then you can uh, easily apply the energy balance energy coming in is equal to energy uh, going out or wc is equal to mass flow rate into hd minus he or specific work of compression wc by uh, m dot is equal to hd minus he that means if you know the exit and the inlet enthalpies you can easily find out the specific work input to the compressor okay that is what is shown here wid is equal to okay this is hd hd minus he okay the above equation can also be obtained from the thermodynamic relation tds is equal to dh minus vdp okay this relationship is valid for uh, both reversible as well as irreversible processes but for an isentropic process we know that uh, ds is equal to zero that means dh is equal to vdp for an isentropic compression process and wid that is a specific work input is nothing but integral vdp and for this special case of isentropic pr process uh, vdp is equal to dh so integral vdp is equal to integral dh from pe to pc since dh is a property simply you can write this as integral dh is equal to h t minus h e that is exit and inlet enthalpies of the refrigerant okay remember that this is uh, only for an isentropic process that means there is no heat transfer from the uh, compressor if there is a heat transfer the expression will be different now let us look at an ideal so far we have been discussing an ideal compressor without clearance that means uh, the suction stroke starts with uh, zero refrigerant inside the a uh, cylinder okay and in actual compressors this is not possible okay some amount of clearance has got to be provided in actual compressors so what we do is we eliminate the assumption of no clearance okay still we'll, we are discussing ideal compressors only so now let us look at ideal compressors with clearance first of all why do we need clearance in actual compressors a small clearance is left between the cylinder head and the piston to accommodate the valves and to take care of thermal expansion and machining tolerances okay um, if you don't provide any clearance uh, then due to uh, toler tolerances or thermal expansion uh, there could be problem okay also you have to accommodate the valve so you have to provide some gap between the um, uh, cylinder head and the piston and as a thumb rule the clearance c in millimeters is given by c is equal to 0.005 l plus 0.5 uh and phi is written as i said in millimeters and here l is the stroke length in millimeters this is uh, generally a thumb rule and uh, this space along with all other spaces between the closed valves and the piston at the inner dead center is called as the clearance volume okay so clearance volume is not just the space between the closed valve and the piston but all other uh, spaces when the valves are closed okay so all these spaces are known as clearance volume vc and the ratio of the clearance volume to the swept volume is called as clearance ratio epsilon that means epsilon is defined as vc divided by vsw where vsw is the uh, swept volume of the compressor that is uh, uh, number of cylinders into pi d square by 4l okay in meter cube and the clearance ratio epsilon depends on the arrangement of the valves in the cylinder and the mean mean piston velocity and this value can vary anywhere between uh, 4 to uh, 12 to 13 percent due to the presence of the clearance volume at the end of the discharge stroke some amount of uh, refrigerant at the discharge pressure pc will be left in the clearance volume okay so what happens is uh, Uh, because of this uh, clearance uh, uh, this discharge does not uh, go up to this point but it stops at some point c okay so some volume is left at this point and at this point the return stroke starts so at this point you can see that the pressure is pc which is much greater than 
pressure PE. That means the pressure at this point is PE and the pressure at this uh, at the beginning of the suction stroke is PC. Since PC is greater than PE, this valve cannot open. Okay. So, uh, a part of the suction stroke is simply utilized for reducing the pressure from PC to PE. That means, this is the portion which is used for reducing the pressure from PC to PE. Okay. So, the suction valve opens only when the pressure falls to the evaporator pre pressure PE. Okay. So, what is the net effect of this? The net effect of this from this is, is that uh, this is the piston displacement okay that means v a minus v c is the piston displacement but the actual volume of uh, refrigerant uh, that has entered into the cylinder is v a minus v d okay and uh, you can see from this figure that v a minus v d is less than v a minus v c right that means the displacement rate is higher than the volumetric flow rate of the uh, refrigerant that means the uh, volumetric efficiency of the compressor is less than 100% Okay, so that is what is mentioned here. So, hence the actual volume uh, volume of the refrigerant taken uh, that entered the cylinder during suction stroke is less than compressor displacement. As a result, the volumetric efficiency of the compressor with clearance is less than 100 percent, and this is defined as VA minus VD divided by VA minus VC. Okay, so that is uh, as I've already explained. And let us uh, try to find an expression for this. So volumetric efficiency is uh, for this condition is V A by V D, V A minus V D divided by V A minus V C. Now let us uh, subtract and add V C. Okay, so let us write this as V A minus V C plus V C minus V D divided by V A minus V C, which is equal to one plus V C minus V D divided by V A minus V C. Now the clearance uh, ratio epsilon is defined as V C by V swept uh, that is swept volume and swept volume in this case is nothing but V A minus V C. Okay. So, from this expression V A minus V C is written as V C divided by epsilon. Okay. So, if you substitute this in this expression you can show that the clearance volumetric efficiency is nothing but uh, 1 plus V C minus V D divided by V A minus V C that is finally equal to 1 plus epsilon minus epsilon into V D by, v -D by v -C. Since the mass of refrigerant in the cylinders at point C and D, that means at the uh, beginning of the suction stroke are same. You can uh, write this expression. That means you can express the volumes in terms of specific volumes. Okay, V D by V C in terms of specific volume ratio, small V D by small V C. Okay, that means clearance volumetric efficiency can be written in terms of specific volume ratio. Okay. And uh, if the re-expansion process also follows uh, PV to the power of k is constant, then you can uh, write uh, for the re-expansion process this expression. That means V d by V c is equal to P d by P c by P d to the power of one by k, which is nothing but P c by P e to the power of one by k, where P c is the condenser pressure and P is the evaporator pressure. So finally, you find that the clearance volumetric efficiency is simply given by one plus epsilon minus epsilon into P c by P e to the power of 1 by k or this can also be written in terms of pressure ratio R p which is nothing but the ratio of condenser pressure divided by evaporator pressure. And if the process is reversible as I have already explained but not adiabatic then k uh, has to be replaced by a polytropic index uh, n. Okay. So, with for any reversible process this is the expression for clearance volumetric efficiency. Okay. So, the exp uh, from the expression for clearance volumetric efficiency, we can uh, deduce that the volumetric efficiency decreases as the pressure ratio and clearance ratio increase. Okay. And for a given compressor, that means for a fixed uh, uh, clearance ratio epsilon, there is a limiting pressure ratio at which the clearance volumetric efficiency becomes 0. Okay. Uh, this, is, uh, this value is given by this expression and the R p maximum at which the clearance volumetric efficiency becomes 0 is simply equal to 1 plus epsilon divided by epsilon to the power of n. Okay. That is basically obtained by equating the expression for volumetric ratio to 0. Okay. This is also shown in this figure. Okay. So, if you are plotting uh, the volumetric clearance volumetric efficiency versus the pressure ratio for different values of index of compression okay you get this kind of curve here uh, the efficiency is 0 and here the efficiency is 1 and uh, the rp varies from a value of 1 to some uh, some value okay and at this point that is that means for this n 
at this uh, limiting value of Rp the volumetric efficiency becomes 0. And the mass flow rate of refrigerant with clearance volume is simply equal to m dot Cl is equal to uh, displacement rate of the compressor into volumetric uh, efficiency that is uh, eta VCL into displacement rate divided by specific volume of the refrigerant at compressor inlet. So uh, from this expression you can see that the volumetric efficiency is less than 1 that means the mass flow rate and hence the refrigeration capacity of the system decrease as the volumetric flow efficiency reduces. In other words the required size of the compressor increases as the volumetric efficiency decreases. Now let us quickly look at the work input to compressor with clearance. If the index of compression is equal to the index of expansion uh, then the extra work required to compress the vapor that is left in the clearance volume will be exactly equal to the work in work output obtained during the re-expansion process. That means uh, uh, the work input uh, uh, during the compression process will be exactly equal to the work output during the re-expansion process. That means uh, the clearance does not play any role uh, in the work input and there is no penalty because of this. Hence the total work input to the compressor during one cycle will then be equal to the area of the cycle diagram on PV diagram. Okay. And the specific work with and without clearance will be given by the same expression. Okay. So the expression remains same whether uh, for expression for specific work remains same whether uh, compression taking place with or without clearance. However, the power input to the compressor and mean effective pressure will be different with and without clearance because the mass flow rate is different. Okay. So even the specific work input remains same, work input and MEP will be different and that is given by these expressions. Okay. A power input is M dot into WID, so where uh, the clearance volumetric efficiency is, co is coming into picture. Uh, similarly for MEP and you can see that both power input and MEP reduce with clearance. Okay. So let me uh, quickly uh, sum up what we have discussed in this lesson. In this lecture the following topics were discussed, classification of refrigerant compressors open and hermetic compressors, ideal compressor without clearance and its performance characteristics, ideal compressor with clearance and its performance characteristics and uh, the performance and design aspects of reciprocating compressors will be discussed in the next lecture. And let me give the answer to the homework problem in given in the last class, the answer to this problem is 62 kilowatts. Okay, thank you.